Hey everyone, I'm excited to bring you uh, another special guest. Dr. McCola is here. How are you, Dr. McCola? I'm doing great. Good. I guess uh, you know I'm up here in uh, Maryland. It's uh, snow outside. It's freezing. I need some sun. I need some vitamin D. Uh, looks like you you have some nice vitamin D down there. We do. Well, I'm, it's a little bit deceptive because I just got back from a week in Costa Rica. And, oh. Uh, but it is, it's going to be in the 70s today, so and sunny, so that's, that's good. I suppose it was rough. You had to put a towel on when you got out of the pool, right? That was pretty, uh, well, <laughs> pretty cool. Well, I'm not a big pool person. I'd rather swim in the ocean. So. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Uh, so, um, you know, we're going to basically, it's non-scripted. We're going to just, I want to go through some things today with you. Um, uh, lately, uh, I'm sure you heard the news, J Jillian Michaels, she had uh, this whole thing against the ketogenic diet. Have you heard about mm -hmm. that? She's a seriously confused woman. Yeah, yeah. So I did a video on her and uh, on her confusion, and, and we basically got 6,700 views an hour in the last wow. two days. Yeah, so it's just, it's yeah, blowing up. Gotta, and uh, it's- got to share the truth on that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been three days, and we're, it's like 2,500 views an hour. So there's a lot of interest in this This topic. woman is a personal trainer. She doesn't have formal science training, okay? I know. Gee. I know. I know. She's, a, she's a TV celebrity. She's not a scientist she, or a clinician. No, I know. She has a, has a major confusion on insulin. She doesn't understand what that word is and what it does. Yeah. Uh, so, Sadly. Yeah. yeah, I know. So a um, couple things I wanted just to kind of uh, bring up. You, you've recently read, you, you recently wrote two books and you're, you're on mm -hmm. your uh, next one. Actually, you, you have a lot of books. Um, but one of the <laughs> books... <laughs> Actually, I'm working. On, I'm actually currently working. Well, I'm actually not working on two books. One for next year and the year after. So I'm doing this in parallel. You know, um, I can't just work on one project. I have to do several things at once. I just get sure. bored. So I have to kind of multiply. Well, it's not a bored thing. It's just that there's there are really important topics that need to be uh, to be out there. So and one of them is personal too. It's for longevity. So that's that's uh, you know. As I'm writing the book, I'm learning things and applying them for myself. So by the time the book is written, I'll have had a lot of experience and personally be able to validate many of these strategies. That's great. Um, the first topic I want to bring up is intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. um, you, your, your next book that you're writing, you're, you found some interesting data with uh, detoxing, like when people do. I, I think you, you know, most of the toxins are stored in the fat cells. So what happens if you detox or fast too long, there's a potential of detoxing some of these chemicals. Tell us that more is about correct. that. correct. Yeah. So it's actually, it's not intermittent. Intermittent fasting was my last book with Fat for Fuel, okay. uh, which essentially describes a process that is necessary to become metabolically flexible and you can actually regain the ability to burn fat because I would say three fourths of the population aren't able to do this because of their. Uh, consistent indulgence in excessive carbohydrates, which essentially shuts down their ability to burn fat effectively. And they develop insulin resistance and then secondarily all these other metabolic consequences, especially obesity. So that's the baseline if you, you know, to, to just stab, establish metabolic flexibility. And that's typically done with a compressed eating window, which is the most one of those profoundly simple and effective strategies to regain health is just to restrict the time you're, that you're eating, the window eating period to about six to eight hours. And you right. may, you know, it, it's shocked me, but I guess it shouldn't have that 90%, nine out of 10 people eat more than 12 hours a day, let alone six or eight. We're talking 12, 12 hours. It's not natural. It's just not natural, yeah. but we're so used to it. It's this, what, what do you, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, massive uh, habit of just snacking. Like it's almost like you, people can't even go a few hours without eat. They have to constantly snack and it's pushed yeah. on us. 20%. I'm not opposed to snacking. It's not like a magic. You'd have one or two meals. In fact, I have a six hour eating window and I eat liberally in those six hours. I you know, and, but before those six hours or after those six hours, I don't eat. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Like yeah, snacking so, at night, in the morning. Oh, snacking at night is one of the worst things uh, you could possibly do to your body. And yeah. I bet, you, I bet your uh, viewers would like to know why. Because when you're, get, when you're consuming calories, you're, you're converting those calories to energy. And the process, the, ener the, 
biochemical metabolism that's required to do that generates reactive oxygen species. And they tend to back up and you ex exponentially expand the production of those uh, oxidative stressors when you eat when you're not using the energy. And that's exactly what you do when you eat before you go to bed because your, your energy consumption drops dramatically when you're sleeping. There's no need to have extra energy. So it's just, you're just damaging your body when you do that. So that one of the most important principles is not to eat for three hours before you go to sleep. So let's just clarify that for those people. When you talk about uh, ROS or reaction oxygen species in mm -hmm. relationship to what you said, just make it really simple. Like what, how could someone really get that? What, what does that mean? Well, there is a process that occurs when you're creating energy. And it usually occurs in our mitochondria. Those are these little organelles in our cells that are con considered to be the energy producers. And they create ATP and that process um, is, has a leaky production of these um, electrons that go out and they cause free, rad they cause reactive oxygen species which are responsible for producing free radicals which can create cellular damage and proteins, Got DNA, it. cell membranes. Okay. So, and, that, and it, the, 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 and many people have heard that and they think free radicals are bad but actually, the truth is that you need a certain level of them to operate and be healthy. They're important biological signaling molecules. So that if you indiscriminately suppress them with excessive antioxidants, that could actually cause problems. But the key here is not to take external exogenous supplementations, but to limit the production. And one of the ways you can do that is by not exposing yourself to ionizing radiation. There's no dispute here. This is non-controversial. The last thing you want to do is stand in front of an X-ray or a CAT scan on a regular basis because you're going to die prematurely or handle radioactive material. We know that. Uh, and if we have time later on, we'll talk about the non-ionizing radiation. But similarly, you don't want to expose yourself to excessive oxidative stressors by eating at the wrong time because it's going to cause similar damage. Okay, so now um, when you talk about, I mean, like just eating in general or certain things will create more oxidative stress. Both, actually. Timing is probably the crucial one, but certainly eating the wrong foods, things like trans fats or uh, industrially processed vegetable oils, you know, are really pernicious to your health. And, and uh, the trans fats are probably, and the industrially processed oils are worse than sugar in my view, because the sugar will create these, this pulse of oxidative stress, but then it's gone. It doesn't do any long-term damage from that perspective. But these industrial oils get embedded in your cell membranes. They stick around for a long time, mm -hmm. and they really plug up your system and make it difficult to stay healthy. So when you don't eat, when you're fasting, what happens with these, do you just have less free radical damage? Well, you're not, well, because you're eating at the right times, you're not creating excessive free radicals, but there's, there's a lot of other magic that occurs, metabolic magic, when yeah. you're not eating, because you're replicating what our ancestors did. They went regularly through times of not eating, and uh, they never had access to a refrigerator 24 seven where they can eat like most of our population does. I said 90% of people eat more than 12 hours a day. I mean, that's essentially every waking hour they're eating. You know? That's crazy. The moment they get up to the moment they go to bed, and that is a prescription for metabolic disaster. So uh, that was one, that was one aspect. And the other is that, uh, I, well, I forgot what the, 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 your question was there. Well, just, just the relationship to when you, um, when you don't eat, I think there's a fa fasting elicits oh, no. some genetic. Other things that yeah. go on, right? The other things go on. So that what happens when you're not eating is that you will actually stimulate some very important metabolic, metabolic process called autophagy, yeah. which is from the Greek word to to self eat, and that is a cleanup process that you have these cellular debris, these organelles, these cells that clog up your system that essentially are removed when you're not eating because your system shuts down and does clean and repair. And then your digestive system is given a chance to rest too so that you are less likely to have leaky gut and absorb these uh, large molecules from your food that you're eating into your system and cause autoimmune problems. So it's, it's really an important process that we're designed to follow if we want to stay healthy. Oh yeah. You know, I was, before I was a Cairo, I was a uh, x-ray tech and uh, I did x-rays in nursing homes. I would, portable x-rays, so I'd go out there and I didn't have time to, you know, properly bring a shield. I would take x-rays with this little unit, like from one foot away and no shield. Like I know I was filled with radiation. So um, that's just something that 
in the back of my mind. That's why I'm kind of like really um, adamant well, about maintaining. Well, you're not filled with it. Like you can be filled with glyphosate from eating non or GMO foods, but you can't be filled with radiation. You're exposed to it, and then it causes damage that you have to deal with. And fortunately, there are some strategies because the ionizing radiation you're exposed to as an X-ray tech is very similar to the radiation you're exposed to flying at 35,000 feet. I don't know about you, but I, I'm pretty much on an airplane at least once a month. And there are some really effective strategies. And would you like to know one of the simplest and least expensive strategy to protect it yourself? To do with fasting? To protect, but when you're flying? Does it have to do with fasting? It has to do with fasting. <laughs> okay, okay. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> ding, 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 because you upregulate. You, the other interesting thing when you don't eat food is that you increase the, the levels of one of the most important coenzymes in your body, which is NAD, nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. And that is really the fuel for an enzyme that repairs the DNA damage response. So it helps repair the damage. And it's called poly, poly ADP ribose polymerase, or PARP for short. And it, it, so when you're, the ionizing radiation comes in and damages the DNA, this PARP can facilitate the repair. But this PARP requires NAD. So when you're fasting, you're going to increase your NAD levels. Now, there's other ways you can do that. You can take exogenous ketones, which uh, is very expensive. It's going to be about $25 to $40 a dose, depending on how much ketones you're taking. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it'll work. It'll work pretty simple. In fact, they're studying this exogenous ketones with the NASA is for the astronauts to, to mitigate ionizing radiation damage. But you can just do it by not eating. And... Uh, you know, that gets into my next book, which is Keto Fast, that comes out in May, which talks about the benefits of partial fasting as opposed to long-term multi-day water fasting, which is what I was thinking I was going to promote because initially, like this time last year, I thought five-day water fast was the best metabolic intervention I'd ever seen in my entire clinical career. And it still is powerful, but I think in the 21st century, it's not a wise solution. That's the conclusion I reached after studying this very carefully. Now I recommend a partial fast, which I describe in keto fast. Like intermittent fasting. I'm sorry? Intermittent fasting. No, it's different. Intermittent fasting, let me, let me describe what keto fast is because it's a bit confusing. Intermittent fasting is the base. So that you do this for, you know, eat within the six to eight eight hour window for at least a month, and then you're metabolically flexible. And upon that platform, you add another level of fasting, which is you would, your first meal, instead of having the whatever, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 calories a day that you normally eat, your first meal of the day after fasting for 18 hours would be anywhere from 300 to 600 calories, maybe 800 if you're a really big muscle builder. So you just have that one meal, and that's the only thing you eat. That, and then for 24 hours, you don't eat anything else. So for 42 hours, you're only having anywhere from 300 to 500 calories, and that's it. So that's the partial fast, which will not give you the identical benefits of a five-day water fast, but will give you a large percentage of them, probably 80 to 90% of the benefits, which virtually none of the downside, which involves liberation of these toxins from your fat cells and being unable to effectively process and eliminate them from your body causing further damage to your so, cells. So, um, so clarify that. So we're talking about a pattern of eating and not eating. Mm -hmm. um, and you said, you know, you have this certain intermittent fasting and then periodically you do um, yeah, periodically. That's right. That's the yeah. key is periodically. It's not something you do every day. Right. Because just like exercise, if you do exercise, intense exercise every day, you will kill yourself prematurely. You're digging a hole that you can't get out of. This, and, and, and fasting or partial fasting is very similar to exercise in that it's, it's a pulse. It definitely, in some ways, weakens your body, but it makes it stronger when you get out of it on the other side. So you only want to do this like once or twice. If you're, if you're metabolically deranged or damaged, then like say you weigh 100 pounds overweight, then you may want to do it twice a week. But for healthy people, I think once a week is enough, maybe even a little bit less than that. But I try, depending on my schedule, when I gain enough weight, I'll, I'll partial fast. Like I, I, I partial fasted Sunday and today we're, we're reporting this on a Thursday. So, and, and I lost six pounds and I regained the six pounds. And so then when I get to that threshold of weight, then I, then I can know I can partial fast. Because I'm going to lose five or six pounds when I partial fast. That's just the way it works. It's and, interesting because you're, you're talking about something that I... I'm also experimenting on, experimenting on right now as well. When it, you know, because you think about 
it's it's a little bit like muscle confusion. If you mm -hmm. tra training yeah. over time um, decreases your gains because your body adapts to it. So you have to constantly switch it up because um, it's and that probably goes with intermittent fasting. I mean, if you take a look at um, how our bodies were designed way back, um, it wasn't such a regular thing. It was like one day we're eating, two days we're not. You know, right, right. So Depending on your access to food and yeah. availability. Yeah, I mean, you see this in nature all the time. I'm watching this brilliant Planet Earth 2 on the BBC documentary on Netflix, and it's just so fascinating to watch the animals in nature. I mean, you know, but I mean, a lot of them don't make it. They just don't get the food, you know, and they're dead. Right. But I, I mean, just, that food supply is not guaranteed on a regular basis. It's intermittent. Yeah, yeah my wife and I were just watching that last night, too, with the little starfish, and they're, they're like, I mean, the tide's coming, and I'm like, this is incredible what this yeah oh it's just show. amazing if you have, and i think that's blue ocean or planet ocean yeah this one's planet earth oh which, okay which is i like to even i mean i like it even better because it's terrestrial animals and it's like it's just so fascinating it's, it's wild wild stuff i was gonna i wanted to ask about um an interesting phenomenon that occurs and you touched on it um when you fast um there's a your body basically resists stress um, it protects you. I guess it's a, I guess it's the term is it resist um, oxidative stress. It actually, it's not like an emergency, like, like Julie Michaels, she's saying, oh yeah, ketosis, fasting, it's an emergency state. I'm like, actually, um, it's not necessarily <laughs> stressful. It's going to, your body is going to actually protect you against oxidative damage. And that is a very interesting uh, phenomena because you would think it's just the opposite. Oh, I'm going to starve. I'm stressed out. I'm not going to eat. She hasn't. She probably doesn't even know what a ketone is. No. So for no. your and many of your viewers may not either. So it's you know we hear it all the time. But what the hell is a ketone? You know, it is a simply put, it's a very small chain, usually two, three, or four carbon chain fat. That's because it's so short, it's water soluble, and it is can essentially penetrate almost every cell in your body. It can easily pass the blood-brain barrier and supply your brain with fuel that makes it mentally alert and sharp. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, it, you know, just one side note on that, just because um, what I don't understand about, and the reason I'm bringing this up, just because it was a hot topic, and I wanted to, for those of you that are listening, um, you know, there's a, Dr. Axe is uh, one of his companies called uh, Ancient Nutrition, I think, and she's, mm -hmm. she's one of the investors uh, oh, of yeah. that company. And I'm just surprising because why would you bash keto if you're investing in a company that has all these keto products? So it's just, it's weird. I don't understand it. So yeah. anyway. Inconsistent. Yeah. Um, I now, um, you mentioned about radiation. Uh, what about EMF? I just want to, a lot of people don't know what that is. I know you're, you're interested in it. You, you know a lot about it. Just give us some data on that. Well, there we could talk about that for hours. Essentially, the reason why there's a lot of confusion on it relates to the reason why there's confusion about conventional medicine, because there's very powerful corporations, and, and with respect to medicine, that's primarily the drug companies, that uh, can go out and influence the public. And in fact, there was an article published two weeks ago in JAMA that uh, reviewed medical marketing, and in, in 1997, they spent $2 billion on direct-to-consumer advertising. Direct-to-consumer advertising. This is what you see on TV. That was in 1997, okay, wow. to confuse people. Now, remember, the United States is only one of two countries in the world where this is legal. You can't do it in any, almost any other country in the world. Interesting. So what do you think they spent 2016? What did it go up to? Literally 20 years later. I have no idea. Ten billion dollars. What? Ten billion dollars was spent direct to consumer advertising. Okay, that sounds like a lot, right? What did they spend in 1997 for 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 manipulating, deceiving, and confusing physicians? How much? Sixteen billion. What? In 2016, it went up to thirty billion dollars. Oh my so, gosh! You know, and this is so. That sounds like a lot of money. It is. And the reason I went on this tangent is that most of your viewers are familiar with the process of manipulation and deception and fraud that occurs in medicine. Otherwise, they wouldn't be watching your channel, wouldn't be watching me. So 
the, where they're not familiar with, they're not familiar with is the EMF component. And you need to understand that the level of corporate influence is exponentially higher when it comes to the telecommunications industry. They dwarf the pharmaceutical industry. Really? So they have been able to essentially manipulate the federal regulatory agencies, including the FTC, the FDA, the EPA, that this is safe. They, these guys are bought and sold. I mean, the former head of the FTC was the head of the telecommunications lobbying industry. It's like, this is a chicken, a fox guarding the hen house. Wow. So, and, and we don't have to look, there's a great, there's a, I don't think it's on Netflix, it's on uh, Amazon Prime, you have to pay for it, I think, uh, is um, Merchants of Doubt, which does a brilliant expose on the, the corporate influence on a lot of these policies. And they, 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 they focused a lot on tobacco industry. And it, there's also a book, if you prefer reading, which preceded the movie or the documentary. But the, the purpose of this is to, know, to understand that the CDC and the FDA, I believe it was the FDA, F, FDA and the CDC both came out, Surgeon General, and denounced smoking. Yet the tobacco industry was able to convince the public and created enough doubt that they were able to delay the final acknowledgement and the day of the dangers of smoking for three decades, 30 years. Now, again, tobacco industry is penis compared to tele telecommunications. And we don't and and they had the federal regulatory agencies saying that it was harmful. We don't have that with EMF. So understand the very basic protective mechanisms that are, the government is supposed to have don't work when it comes to EMF. It, they just don't work. So that you have to understand that the, any of the public health authorities, that what you're going to see in the media, which is bought and sold for by the industry, is going to confuse the heck out of you. Wow. Yet, there are, like the Bio Initiative Report, published a few years ago, and it's updated annually, has thousands and thousands and thousands of studies documenting clearly in peer-reviewed published journals the science that, 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 that authentically validates the danger of these exposures. You're talking about EMF. EMF, yes. That stuff. That stuff, yeah. So you're holding a cell phone. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that it's in airplane mode. Um, good question. Let, let's see Find if it's if, No, it's not an air, airline, air, airplane oh. mode. Yeah. Okay, so the airplane mode. Okay, all right. Well, you, you, that's good. I mean, even Dr. Bird did not put it in airplane mode. And hopefully, I will be able to convince him of the danger. From my perspective, unless you have a medical emergency or something that's really just shockingly critical, you should never have your phone on your body unless it's in airplane mode. And this is even validated by the instructions that come with each and every phone. It needs to be a, at least six to eight millimeters away from your body. Okay, so first of all, why, why should we keep it on airplane mode? Well, because that will lower radically by orders of magnitude the radiation that comes out from it. It won't eliminate it, but it almost does. So basically, I have to turn it on right now, right? Aer is airplane it, mode. Yeah, you have to turn it on, right? <laughs> and th then you can put it on. Then you put it on your body. You, is your damage? I mean, I you know, know Senator, this. you know, Senator McCain died recently, right? Yeah, glioblastoma. That was from his cell phone. He also got a parotid tumor. Is that exactly where he held the cell phone? Wow. So, I mean, it it doesn't discriminate against you know who you know, who you are, what type of political office you hold, or how much money you have. It's going to hit you either way. So, so this, this information you're saying, it's not readily available. I mean, it's like, there's probably been well, it's, slightly it's, suppressed. It's, it's readily available, but there's just like, that's why the book Merchants of Doubt is so good because it helps you understand the strategies that the cor mm -hmm. these corporations use. And it wasn't just tobacco. Uh, it's asbestos and climate change, global warming. It's this whole, there, there's a litany of about six different areas that they discuss and it's the same darn strategy every time wow and in fact the telecommunications industry is still they they hire the same pr agencies oh. that tobacco did interesting
you know, so you have to understand that, you know, because people are going to think I'm, I'm way out there and I'm confused and I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But once you understand the foundational realities of what was that seeking to confuse you, then you, then you can realize, well, maybe there is something more to this and you can easily validate this. You can do this yourself. The problem is most of us don't have the time. Right. You know, I'm in a position in life where I've delegate, been able to delegate almost every non-essential thing in my life out, and I just have loads of time where I can research this stuff. And most people don't have that luxury. So, right. you know, I, and I can read it and compile it and put it together and put it in a book that you can read. And there's other people who do that too. I'm not the only one, certainly. But, you know, it's there, and you can independently assess it and, and figure it out yourself. Fascinating. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm very, very, very sensitive to this phone. I can't, I hate talking to the phone. I I yeah. never, ever hold it up to my ear. Uh, however, the, uh, and I don't know a tremendous amount about EMF, but the way I learned about it is I used to do seminars in all the governmental agencies in Washington, D.C. And um, I went into the, uh, an agency, the National, uh, Sci no, National Science Institute. I go in there to do a seminar, and this guy came up to me. He was one of the scientists, and he, he says, what's your thoughts on EMF? And at that time, I didn't really have any data. And he started to educate me from, he was doing research at that institution on EMF and telling me, um, yeah, it, it can create tumors, it, it creates this. And I'm, I was just, I was a sudden awareness of like, I had no idea. And if you're studying this, um, you know, it, there's must be something to it. Um, yeah, there is a lot to it. And um, the, we're not going to, as I said, we would need two to three hours to cover this comprehensively, and I could easily do that without notes. But uh, we don't have the time to do that now. So for those who are interested in this a simple book that's easy to read and gives you a lot of practical strategies, uh, until mine comes out in 2020, would be The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMF by Nicholas Penault. And it's available on Amazon. So that's, that's a good one. It's, because it's, it goes with basically, it's not for the the research savvy scientist or clinician who wants the detail because this is written for the consumer, which is, you know, really the target of most of the people watching this. So that, that's a strategy for sure. And the other component to understand, we talked about NAD before. Now there's, if, for those of you who are, are a little more science oriented, there's a, an incredible research paper written 12 years ago now, it was written 2007 by Paul Patcher, P-A-C-H-E-R. And it's called, Perioxynitrite, P-E-R-O-X-Y-N-I-T-R-I-T-E, Perioxynitrite in Health and Disease. And it's a literally 140 page paper. It is a book, it is a book. And it has 1400 references. It is literally, I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of studies every year. And this is one of the best written papers I've ever read in my life. It is just unbelievable. And it's free. There's no charge for it. A lot of, you know, half the journal articles, you got to pay $30, $40 to get. This right. is free. Go online on Google, type in what I, the, the headline I gave you, the title, and you'll get, get this paper. And he helps you understand this is such a foundational critical paper. It really is the foundation for the next three books I'm writing, is to understand we talked about oxidative stress, and we then most people think ROS, reactive oxygen species, but it's not just ROS, it's RNS, reactive nitrogen species. Mm. And the, the, the most toxic, probably the most toxic species is perioxynitrate. So what the heck is it? Well, this is what happened. This is, so just understand, it is a thing that you, you and I were not taught in school, and I would say almost all medical students today are not taught in school, okay? Because this is biology that just was figured out in the last 10 years or so, maybe 15 years. Uh, so, and then I learned about it from Martin Paul, who should, in my view, should get a, Mar a Nobel Prize for this. He's a little too deep for most people watching, uh, but he does, and P-A-L-L, -L, Martin Paul, P-A-L-L. -L. And you can just type in Martin Paul and EMF on YouTube and get, he's got dozens of hour or longer lectures will go into the deep science of it in, in far more detail than I have time to do now. But he told me about Perix, I mean, he talks about Perix and Nitrogen in his lecture and he assumes like everyone knows about it, but no one knows about it. That's why this paper I mentioned is so critical because it'll help you understand it, because this is a foundation. And the, the problem is when you're exposed to EMF, like you are when your phone wasn't in airplane mode, or almost everyone watching this because they are in a home where the Wi-Fi is on. And believe me, if you don't understand this, you need to know that having a Wi-Fi 
modem in your home on is like having a cell phone tower in your house. Yeah, that is uh, oh it's the God. same thing. That's why when I'm talking to you from my home studio and I do not have any Wi-Fi in here, I have a very safe signal. I'm, I'm, I'm in the green zone with respect to I'm less than 0 0.01 volts per meter of radio frequency wow. exposures. So that's green. But almost everyone is watching this on Wi-Fi and they got their phone on, they're getting blasted. So what is happening? What is happening when you do that? These radio frequency signals, typically in the gigahertz range, but even at lower frequencies, will go and stimulate the voltage-gated calcium channels, the VGCCs. They're embedded in all the cell membranes. The neurological tissue like the brain and the, the uh, conduction pathways in your heart have the highest densities. So that's why there's so many people now with brain tumors and cardiac arrhythmias, a fib, a flutter, you know, and if you know anyone who has these conditions, you've got to tell them about EMF because that's probably, that's a good likelihood that's what's causing it. So anyway, the, these voltage-gated calcium channels get activated. And it's, it's just a gate, right? It's just like a gate you have on your front yard. When you open it up, things come in. So they're, it's a calcium gate. So the calcium floods in. Calcium is really high outside the cell, orders of magnitude higher than the inside, and when it opens up, the calcium flows in the cell. So what happens when now calcium flies into the cell. It, act, it, it does two primary things. It's a signal and it causes more nitric oxide and superoxide to form. And these are very reactive molecules. They get within a hair breadth of each other, a, a, a hair breadth of a hair breadth of each other and they form peroxynitrite. Why is this so dangerous? Why is it so much? Because the most dangerous ROS is hydroxyl free radical. Hydroxyl free radicals, I, I know many people have heard of this. They, what they don't know about hydroxyl free radical is it only lasts one billionth of one second. What? It's very short lived. It hardly goes anywhere. So most of the, most of the hydroxyl free radical is actually created in energy generation in the mitochondria. So, and, and when it only lasts a billionth of a second, it can only travel for the distance of a protein or so. So essentially that means it doesn't escape the mitochondria. It doesn't go into the cytoplasm, it doesn't travel into the nucleus. But peroxynitrite, not only is it not just the mitochondria, it's hitting all the cells, but the entire cell is going in, but, but it lasts 9 billion times longer than hydroxyl free radical. So it can no easily idea. travel out of mitochondria. Into, it can go out of the cell, back into the cell, into the nucleus, all over, and cause its damage. So it's not as a, aggressively uh, voracious as hydroxyl, but it lasts 9 billion times longer. So it's 9, 9 billion times more potent from that perspective. Now, the hydroxyl uh, radical has to needs either iron or copper to be reactive right no that that's just catalyzed it's called the fenton reaction that, that catalyzes that reaction once it's created it's created so the fenton catalyzes that so if that's another that's another interesting point that uh, most clinicians are ignorant of essentially that's the best term that i would use to describe it that, that excess iron in your body which Almost all your adult males watching this and any postmenopausal women is a problem. So you've got to measure your iron levels and the best way to do that is ferritin. Ideally, it should be between 20 and 40. Simple thing that'll radically lower your risk of heart disease and cancer and dementia. That's right. pretty well documented. Right. So how do we, how do we uh, get these, this, this new radical thing? Well, how do we, is it from the EMF or what, what's creating it? No, no, the primary, that's a great question. The primary catalyst for that is this excessive exposure to EMF. That's the molecular mechanism. See, I, I knew about EMS for two decades, and probably you knew about them for two decades, so three decades. And, you know, we're told by the people who should know that it's dangerous and you should, but it's so darn convenient that we don't want to believe it. Right, right. And, you know, and, and these merchants of doubt are creating doubt and they're creating all these studies that say, well, it doesn't cause it, you know. And, uh, so you're using that as justification to perpetuate your ignorance or lack, not ignorance, but lack of action to effectively mitigate your exposure to this. So that, I was like that up until a few years ago until wow. I, uh, Klinghart catalyzed my interest in this and I started studying and Paul is really the genius in this whole area who's really, should, I think should get a Nobel prize. Uh, but what, so once you, once you understand the mechanism that there's actually hard science behind this, then you start to believe it. Wow. Okay. So, um, it's basically creating this influx of calcium in the cell. What, yeah. what are some of the consequences other than, you know, uh, 
signaling, signaling problems, uh, brain tumors. Well, the consequences are many. That's why the title of my book, the tentative title for 2020 is EMF, the extinction event. Ooh, wow. Yeah, yeah because wow. you're, you're, what is it? I already mentioned earlier, it's gonna hit uh, the heart, so you'll have arrhythmias. But on the beginning end of the spectrum, it's certainly not the only variable, but it's an important variable to contribute to the, the occurrence of autism. And autism, even by conservative measures, the last measure by the government, by the government. When I was in med school, when I started practicing in 85, one in, I didn't see any autistic patients because there was one in 10,000 births were autistic patients. I didn't have 10,000 patients, okay? I've seen tens of thousands of patient visits, but I didn't have 10,000 patients. So I never saw an autistic patient until the incidence started to increase. Now today, they admit, conservatively, and it's probably much higher than this, is one in 40, one in 40, one in 40. Wow. So from one in 10,000 to one in 40. So that's one consequence. Glyphosate is another issue. Vaccines are another issue. Uh, but probably glyphosate and EMF are the two biggest. Um, so that's one. So you've got, you know, and if a child with autism requires caregivers, otherwise they're going to die. They just can't take care of themselves. So you have an enormous amount of resources being invested in the taking care of the autistic patients. And then the other end of the spectrum, you've got Alzheimer's, which we have a tsunami, an epidemic of Alzheimer's, which is clearly EMF is contributing to this. Wow. So, you know, both of those are increasing exponentially. So if you've got, you know, half the population demented and the other half, I mean, we're going to one in two autistic births that are, can't care for themselves. How can the society survive? The only segments or remnants of the population of people who survive are the people aren't exposed to have these types of exposures because they're, you can't, it just, it'll collapse. It, it, it's just destined to collapse unless there's some changes occurring. What, um, now as someone ages, there's definitely this huge problem. And I don't know if this is related with calcium, calcium deposits, you have arthritis, you have calcium. Yeah, well that, there's lower. a lot of variables for that. It's like okay. chronic inflammation and, right. you know, and vitamin K2 is another important because that sucks the calcium from the, the lining of the blood vessels back into the bones where it belongs. So, and it, you know, in a hormonal component. So it's not just a simple, I mean, you shouldn't be taking calcium supplements for the most part, but you should, I mean, right. uh, but you know, magnesium is far more important, but you know, excess calcium could be, in there. but, but it's not, it's more of a symptom than a cause. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So as far as um, the viewers right now, they're kind of probably going to go, all right, you open the can of worms. I at least need to know something about because they all have cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you, the, only put it in airplane mode if it's going to be in your body. That's what it. Ab what about the earphones, the earbuds? They, they have different kinds. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll I'll talk about that in a But let me just finish this airplane mode. Okay. So how often do you charge your phone? Every day. At night. How often do you think I charge my phone? I have no idea. <laughs> Take a guess. Uh, when it runs out? Yeah, well, yeah. So how often <laughs> is that? Um, I guess the phone, depending if it's on, I guess it lasts, what, every two days? Every day and a half? Once, once every seven to 10 days. What? Yeah, that's how often I charge my phone. What? Yeah. How does it last that long? I have a super battery. No, because it's in airplane mode. Ah, uh, wow. So all that's that energy interesting. that you're putting into the battery is creating radio frequencies, which are exposing you, your body, and your family to these, this energy. Interesting. So Fascinating. I, mine, is, mine is on occasionally. I mean, even, but even if you don't use, ever turn it on, it's still going to, the battery probably only lasts maybe two weeks before it goes dead. So, so you basically extend your, bat your, your battery life when you, it's in airplane. Yeah, like mode. exponentially. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then you, your other question was, well, what do you do? You know, how do you protect yourself? Well, the first step is airplane mode is almost all the time and use a landline. Uh, you can easily use a landline by using your computer. There's voice phones on your computer, which is what I do all the time. People cannot call. They know I, I, I don't text. I just do not use my cell phone. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll use text occasionally, but I mean, I get more, I, the amount of texting I do in a day, in a year is equal to most people's, what they do in a day, essentially. You know, I do it to Uber or catch an Uber or something. And it's not a text, but that's a, uh, using my cell phone. But anyway, so what can you do? 
it, when you do use it, make sure it's far from your body. So if you're going to hold it, use speakerphone. You know, that's a lot easier and more convenient because you always have speaker, always have the speakerphone option. You're never not necessarily going to have your headphone. That's, that's inconvenient and it's a hassle. So most of the time, you just go to a quiet place. You know, I mean, you don't want to uh, annoy or disturb others. So like if I'm in an airplane lounge and you know, that's the only phone I have, and I'll use my, but I'll, I'll hold it far from me and I'll have it on the speaker mode. I mean, you're still hurting your hand, but at least it's far away from the, what really counts because the, the, your friend is distant. So the further away from your body it is, the, the better. And you have to know, though, and I, with, with the equipment, the, and the best meter to get for rate measuring radio frequencies for everyone is the, called the Acousticom 2. Acoustic, just like it sounds, with an OM and a 2. You get that? It's very hard to find, though, because it's, it's, so it's a very obscure website. It's called Amazon. <laughs> It's about hundred fifty dollars, and and I actually the battery lasts long. I think I've had mine for two years, and I haven't changed the battery. But it's wow. it's an analog signal, so you can actually it has an acoustic sound, so you can get uh, audio feedback, and by the type of the sound, it can tell you what where the signal is coming from. Is it coming from a cell phone? Is it coming from a Wi-Fi a router? Is it coming from a, ce a cell phone tower? So it's it's pretty interesting. So for and then it can also tell you the level. You can see it and hear it. And so for those of you that are watching, he's talking about a device to measure EMF. Right. Well, so, well one, lab, one type of EMF, there's many types. Well, uh, this is a radio frequency, typically from a few hundred megahertz to like eight gigahertz. But then there's also higher frequencies and radio frequencies. And then uh, there are magnetic fields and electrical fields. This doesn't measure magnetic or electrical fields. Okay, so like around someone's house, what are some of the big sources of uh, EMF? That's a great question. Probably the most important, as I already mentioned, the Wi-Fi router. Wow. Wi-Fi router and your cell phones are the two biggest threats you have to your, to your health. So for that problem, what, what is the solution for that problem? Well, the first step, the baby step to get, put your toe in the water is to turn off your router at night because you're not using it. Okay, turn off your router at night. You can easily do that. You can buy a $25 switch. You plug in your, you actually plug your router into that and then you can control the switch with a, with like a garage remote control opener. But the bet, the long, that's not the long-term solution. Long-term solution is to get rid of your, turn your Wi-Fi off permanently and hardwire your house. Pain in the butt, but it'll, it'll help you and your family quite a bit. You know, I, I agree a hundred percent because I, there was, um, our power went down for three days in our house and all the Wi-Fi went down and man, did I just, I slept better. I felt better. I'm like, what, what's different? I just feel so good. Yeah. And also, also my computer, my hard drive was very close to underneath my desk. And I felt like I was literally being electrified every single day. I was like, a, and I said, get this thing. Well, you're, 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 well, it's not your hard drive. It's that, it's that your computer is using the Wi-Fi signal. It's right next to you. So, and, that, and don't make the mistake I did. Say you hardwire your house, right? You know, have no Wi-Fi. Um, you still have to go to your desktop, even though it has an Ethernet cable in it, and it's getting a signal from the Ethernet. You have to turn the Wi-Fi off. You have to put it in airplane mode, just like your phone. Otherwise, it's continuing to blast you with the signal. Uh, okay. Yeah, That's so it's a comp you, the, the, the devil's in the details. Because your body, it doesn't matter what your intention is. You have to pay attention to the details because your body will suffer otherwise. Can you hurry up and finish this book? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the book is almost finished. I'm just tweaking. I, I, it's already written. I just have to put it together in a, in a, in a cohesive and um, motivating and catalyzing way so that it will convince people of the dangers. But there's a lot of books written out. This is not the only one. And I said Nick's book is really pretty good for the most part. Uh, it's just not going to go into as much of the science as I, I'm going to do and really some of the other components and go more into the deception and the fraud. So that people, because when people understand the basic reason why they're being deceived and manipulated, then they're more open to the science, I think. Because yeah. you just can't hit with a science. You got you to gotta paint the picture for them. Yeah, they, exactly. they see They see the full frame. Yeah, and then the other thing is that um, I think um, one of the big challenges is, especially when I did our, did our summit, we had the speakers fly in. And um, people want application. They want simple ways mm -hmm. of applying it because right. they, just, yeah. they don't want all the science. They want, okay, what do I do with this information? You know, what practical things? Yeah, well, you need to be motivated, first of all. That's the key. 
thing. So that, yeah. that, that, that's the reason for the science. And for me, I, I wasn't, it gave me the simplest impl implementation measures to, to follow, but unless I was convinced it was an issue, I wouldn't have done, I didn't do anything. Right. So I had to be convinced first. Right. But Nick's book goes into great detail, all the little, little things. But the most important thing is your cell phone and your Wi-Fi. I mean, those are wow. the big ones. I mean, wow. the magnetic fields are an issue, but they're pretty easy to find and mitigate against. Electrical fields is a lot more complex uh, topic that we have time to talk about now. Uh, but, uh, but it does things. It, it is a big issue for people who have solar panels. And I happen to have, you know, 15 kilowatts of solar panels on my roof. Uh, and the problem is there's nothing, no pro nothing wrong with the solar panels because they create DC power and DC power is fine. The problem is that you, anyone who's, almost anyone who's using them uh, has an AC converter. So they convert the DC to AC and it's that inverter that causes the complication which creates a massive amount of what's called dirty electricity which inputs high voltage transits into your wiring system which causes electrical fields which go, go throughout the wiring of your house and can cause similar problems as the cell phones. Wow. Same mechanism. Wow. So fortunately, there's things that you can do to, to, to address that. Uh, but most, but you got to know it's an issue to begin with. So right. Yeah. This is fascinating. This is great data. Um, I had no idea. I'm, now you got me really interested. Now I'm going to dive in to yeah. these topics here. I'll well, have... pick up Nick's book because that'll give you the be best strategy right away. Because my yeah. book's not going to be out for, it could be out within a year. I mean, it's essentially written. I just have to fine tune it. Yeah. And the book I'm writing on now will see the book I'm writing on now is going to be it's my masterpiece. It's going to have thousands of references. It's how to it's how to extend your life, but it, but it's based on the uh, the preceding book. So you know intermittent fasting, partial fasting, EMF remediation. You got to do those. That's the basics. Right. You don't do to the advanced stuff until you do the basics. Agreed. So yeah. You get I agree. those things down, and then when you're there, then you can do the fine tuning. Awesome. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. I think a, a lot of people got a lot of great content and also a lot of ideas to start. We opened a can of worms, but now it's time for them also to take, uh, do their own research and start learning about yeah, these. Yeah. Yeah, you got to validate yourself. You know, don't, you know, be a skeptic. I think it's, there, skepticism is a healthy strategy. You know, you have to be careful and, and ideally validate these things yourself. I mean, the internet is a good source. You just have to be careful, especially with, with EMF because you're going to find a lot of confusing material out there based on um, the deception and fraud that the telecommunications industry is introducing oh, into the system. So Absolutely. know that, but you can, you can pretty much, if you go to these studies, you can see who funded them and find out, you know, why they're confused. Fascinating. Wow. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending the time. Okay. Well, good to be with you.